Yeah, so welcome to our last class session of big data today. I've um, I, well, I, I've enjoyed the the big data class quite a bit. I think we talked about a lot of cool things in this class. Uh, today, what we're going to do is sort of a recap of some of the highlights, big picture things to make sure that you take away from this course. And uh, that'll be the first part of um, of today. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the final exam that you'll have next week. And uh, and that'll be that'll be it for us. So let's go ahead and I'll share my screen. And there we go. So I have created a wrap up folder inside of our uh, course uh, GitHub repo. And that's where what we'll look at today. And at the top, just some of the uh, main ideas again of the um, of the course. So we did a lot of DevOps things, and uh, one of the main takeaways that I hope you get from that is that you, uh, if you're not currently using Linux, then uh, then you should be. Even Microsoft uses Linux more than Windows on their systems, especially for uh, data analysis tasks. Um, so like uh, Azure, their, their cloud provider, there are more Linux systems running on that than Windows. So if even Microsoft agrees that Linux is better, then, then it must be better. And we talked a lot about uh, containers. This is kind of goes hand in hand with one of the reasons why Windows or why Linux is better, that um, uh, this Docker system and containers, uh, actually, you can't do that with other operating systems, whether it's Mac or uh, Windows. Um, but, but you can do that uh, with Linux. And so what were some of the advantages of containers? I guess the, the main thing is this idea of like infrastructure in a config file that you don't have to actually go out and plug things together physically. You can just type it out in your file, put it in a git commit, and now you have access to it whenever you want. Um, so if you've never had to do any of that like physical stuff, then you don't realize how much like time that this uh, did save us in this class, um, but, but it really is, is a lot. A lot of other um, sort of big data type classes would maybe have you working directly with say AWS or Azure or DigitalOcean, one of these big cloud service providers and using their um, systems directly, but uh, we didn't want to do that, or I didn't want to do that. I don't like being locked into some particular provider. And the fact that um, we're using Docker means that we can do it locally, we can do it on the cloud. It's just really a one line command difference. There's a Docker compose command that would upload it to whatever cloud service um, you wanted to use. And, uh, and so you can always pick whatever is cheapest or best for whatever your particular task is. Uh, for our container technology, we talked about uh, Docker and Docker Compose. Uh, specifically, there are other technologies. Really, the only other one is Kubernetes. Uh, that's a, so that's Google's offering. It's pretty popular these days, um, but it's significantly more complicated than Docker, which is why we didn't use it. And um, my personal recommendation is that uh, you probably don't need it. Um, unless you're unless you're aiming to compete with Google being being Google scale on things, the main difference is that like Docker we had to actually specify we want one of these services, two of these services. Kubernetes instead you say I want a lag or a response time of 50 milliseconds, and it will automatically decide how many um, services to deploy for that. The other things that we used, uh, I, hopefully you've uh, seen a little bit more of the power of Vim in this class and maybe are even starting to love it and use it as your main text editor. But if not, then I, uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, we used a lot of uh, Git and uh, version control things as well. This is, uh, Git's one of those things that like, I don't know, we've not even scratched the surface of 1% of the things that it can do, but, um, you also really shouldn't spend more time trying to learn Git that uh, you, uh, we've done enough to, to actually get things done. And, and that's really all that, um, all that you should care about. 
Another thing that we spent quite a bit of time in this class, I guess we didn't actually have you write any of these test cases, but on all of these homeworks, there's been test cases that you've had to work with. And um, uh, let's see, so I just saying the, uh, the comment about enough to get things done and um, uh, there's this big debate in uh, the Git community about what Git actually is supposed to stand for. That's one of the official uh, options about what Git can stand for. Uh, the other official option uh, is that it's just a three letter sound or a small sound that was not taken up by anything else. And so when uh, Linus was doing it, uh, uh, he just bashed his keyboard and, and that's what came up with. And then there's some acronym that um, it, it can also stand for, but uh, everybody has one of those three things that they, they like the most. Um, yeah, so yeah, test cases with uh, continuous integration whenever possible, but uh, we've seen a handful of situations where that is and is not possible. So like with the MapReduce programming assignment, that that assignment specifically was working with um, about a terabyte of data. And so that's not, um, not something that you can just upload to, uh, uh, to GitHub. Um, for the, uh, the Postgres assignments though, even the ones working with, uh, with Twitter, one of the, um, um, one of the things that we did was divide up the data set into a much smaller thing, something that we could actually test with and upload that smaller data set up to GitHub with our tests. And so that's a technique that uh, is a good thing to keep in mind in your back pocket when you're, when you're doing these uh, large scale projects. You wanna have your tests, you can't test on all the data, so divide it up into a smaller thing and, uh, and test on that. That will um, save you lots of headaches and save your your collaborators, lots of headaches in the future if you if you keep up with that practice on your projects. It's one of the things that it's really tempting to, okay, I'm doing a small project, I don't need to write good test cases for it. Um, but even on the smallest projects, that's always the first thing that I do is write test cases because I found over the past 15 years or so that I've been programming that I've never once regretted writing test cases for things. That has always, always made me more productive. And then one of the main takeaways from this whole like DevOps Docker sort of thing is that Docker does make all of this a little bit easier, but it's still like a huge pain in the butt to, to get your systems up and running. And I think you've all seen that with um, things like getting your ports lined up and uh, most recently getting things uh, uh, fitting your uh, data inside whatever disk space constraints that you have and making sure that you are deleting things that you don't need anymore so that you can keep, keep fitting in new things. And um, it's a hard, thankless task. And so um, try to avoid it and, and thank the people who are doing it. Um, then we talked about uh, MapReduce. So um, my takeaway from MapReduce is that uh, it's really popular these days. You see a lot of people talking about a lot of companies doing it, but you probably don't want to do it. Um, that it's good when you're doing just like a one-off task because it's a lot easier to set up than a database. Um, but it's also a lot uh, slower when you say repeating the same job multiple times. And most companies, when they're, when they're doing things, you don't just do something once, you do it multiple times. And um, and people turn to MapReduce because they don't really understand how to do things inside of databases. If you do turn to MapReduce, um, my recommendation on how to do that is just plain old bash scripts like we did in class. Um, it's really easy to uh, implement that there's no need to, you can avoid all this Docker nonsense, setting up uh, many servers to uh, coordinate with each other. We did a pretty decent sized data set of uh, about a terabyte with that. Uh, I've done things uh, orders of magnitude larger with this same setup and, and it still works just fine. And one of the things that I really like about it is that the basic ideas are the same. Um, that it's basic, like 
uh, just bash techniques uh, that, you, that you have to learn and understand. And so if you understand those, like how to use bash, then you understand how to do these MapReduce systems in bash really easily. And if there's some other slight feature that you need, you learn a little bit more about bash and that translates over into uh, other tasks, non MapReduce tasks that you'll be doing in the future. Um, other people, let's see, some of the other technologies that we talked about just really briefly in passing, Twitter has this summing bird technology that emphasizes this like mathematical aspect of MapReduce with these monoid homomorphism things. Uh, Apache is a, um, an open source incubator project that has a lot of different open source projects under their umbrella. Hadoop, Hive, and Spark are uh, three, three examples. Hadoop and Hive are specifically like exactly MapReduce. Spark is slightly different, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, if you can do something with Spark, you can do it with MapReduce and vice versa. So people talk about it like it's different, but uh, I don't know, in my perspective, they're the same. And also in my perspective, none of these are worth learning at all or, or using because you can just do bash to do the same stuff. Um, yeah, the, and again, well, let's see. So one of the things that I see companies doing a lot is they'll have um, set up a MapReduce job uh, on let's say AWS or the cloud, some cloud provider, and they're spending a couple thousand dollars a month on, on this MapReduce job um, because it's running regularly and, um, and it, you have to bring up a lot of different computers in, there in order to do, be able to do it. So that's a lot of different uh, a lot of money you're spending on the cloud service provider. But if that company had just done the bash script technique, they could have done it in just one computer, gotten the results faster, and um, and spent a lot less money. Um, that the vast majority of people don't have terabytes of data, just maybe gigabytes of data, probably not even that. And so none of these techniques are up here are worth even bothering for with those. Um, but still, you'll see a lot of companies doing it anyway, just because it's the, the popular thing to do. The, um, yeah, the main part of our course was with, with databases, making those uh, uh, fast with our SQL queries and especially talking in detail about uh, indexes. And uh, my, so, when you want to use a database, anytime you have a query that's going to be repeated multiple times, so MapReduce, one-off task, database, not a one-off task, and basically everything is not a one-off task. Uh, maybe you would start with a MapReduce process just to like test something out, see if it is a reasonable idea, something that you might want to do multiple times, but then you'd migrate it over into a database um, as soon as you have any sort of business requirement based on it. Um, we use Postgres in this course, and I think the community as a whole has been moving more and more towards Postgres um, every year. So it's uh, you'll only see more people using Postgres and going this uh, this route in the future. The main reason for that is because like correctness actually matters in, in your databases. When you do all these analysis, running your SQL queries, you want to get the correct result. That's why you're doing it. And uh, Postgres is really the, the only database that makes that their number one priority. Um, Oracle is also pretty good at that, but uh, things like, well, Oracle itself, you have to spend a million dollars to get to get a license. Um, and that's not like an exaggeration of a million dollars, that's the, like the actual price tag. So. Um, unless you're a bank and the actual law says that you need an Oracle license in order to comply with regulations. Nobody does that. Everybody uses Postgres. Uh, if you're like MySQL or SQL Server, they have their own other advantages, but one of the things that they don't focus on is correctness. And so if you insert data, there's a decent chance, meaning maybe one out of a million, that that data is not going to come back. Um, speed's also one of Postgres's uh, top priorities, but it's admittedly, in some cases, not quite as fast as other databases, especially those NoSQL databases, but like, you're not in that situation where you need that sort of speed. Um, Instagram is not in that situation where they need that sort of speed, 
Uh, they use Postgres for things, and you probably don't have more data than Instagram does. Um, and even Microsoft, when, uh, when they need multi-petabyte data sets, uh, again, they're using uh, Postgres to do that. Postgres on Linux, same tech stack that, that we did in this class. So if, if Microsoft thinks that's the way to go when it's against their business, uh, the things that they're selling, then there's probably good merit to that. Um, so yeah, skip this. So this phrase here, the world's most advanced open source database, this is actually Postgres's tagline. Um, and uh, yeah, we saw a lot in class that there's sort of new features constantly being added that uh, every couple of years, somebody comes out with a new database system that does uh, something really cool that Postgres doesn't do. And people start using that for a couple of years, but then Postgres implements it. And so everybody goes back to Postgres. And then uh, somebody else implements some other new thing. Um, so the first cool thing that we saw, I'll scroll down here, that other people were doing was denormalizing their databases with JSON, MongoDB, and Cassandra being uh, popular examples of databases that do that. Uh, but then Postgres implemented that JSONB type. And so now people go back to Postgres. For full text search, um, there's all of these other systems, Elastic, we've seen Solar, Grunga, um, that people are using. And uh, my prediction is that within five years, uh, everybody will be back on Postgres because all of those features will be native to Postgres. We saw that Instagram, they had to re uh, uh, add memcache as part of their tech stack because Postgres at the time didn't know how to cache results. But then Postgres ad added caching uh, with the materialized views. And so, and so now we don't need memcache anymore. Um, so that's just uh, another reason why we did Postgres in this class is that it's sort of, in some sense, an old boring technology, but it's one that's going to be around for for forever and uh, old boring technologies are the best ones in that sense. I wanted to take a look at this link right here. So this is uh, extremely popular in industry Postgres. And this link takes us to a uh, thread on Hacker News about who is hiring. So every month they have this thread here where companies just post job openings, job um, yeah, job openings. And these are not typically targeted towards like entry level positions like you might be looking at um, after graduating here or internships. Instead, they're more targeted towards mid-level or senior level engineers. But uh, if we do a quick search here for Postgres, then um, so down here, there's, it might be hard for you to see, but there's 49, 50 matches of uh, companies that are advertising using Postgres in their tech stack. And that's out of, um, I don't know, 700 or so different uh, advertisements here. So it's not every company in the world, but it's, uh, as far as databases go, it's, it's the most popular of these days. If you were to search for um, like MapReduce, we don't, you wouldn't get any results here. Uh, any of those specific technologies like um, Hadoop, uh, Spark, those don't get any results. Uh, any of the other databases, so like MySQL, let's see. Um, so six matches for MySQL. Uh, MongoDB has 11 matches. Um, so there are companies using all of these technologies, but, but Postgres is the, is the main one these days. Um, Oh, let's see, I also wanted to do Docker. Docker is also something growing widely in popularity. Um, so here's a advertisement specifically for the Docker company. Um, but then if we scroll through, there'd be a handful of other companies that uh, also using Docker as, as part of their tech stack. And um, so good thing to know for working at those companies. Um, when working with uh, any database, but Postgres in particular, it's good to keep in mind the idea of like normalized data versus denormalized data and how this data is actually going to be represented physically on your, on your hard drives. Um, and there's a lot of different trade-offs that, uh, that we have to make between those two things. That, um, so any data set can be represented in a normalized form or a denormalized form. And 
uh, there's not sort of like just one form that's normalized and one's denormalized. It's this whole spectrum of um, you can make things more normalized or less normalized. And when you make things more normalized, you're generally making things harder to work with while you're doing the insertions. Um, but the trade-off or the benefits is you get less disk space usage and the select queries tend to be much easier to write and uh, much faster. Uh, and then the denormalized, it's the opposite of that. Easier to insert, more disk usage though, and a little bit harder to write the, the select statements quickly. Um, I'd say in practice uh, these days, uh, if you're getting your like information in some sort of already denormalized form, like it's coming out of an API, like Twitter API, people will just keep it in that denormalized form, uh, keep it as a JSON blob. Um, otherwise, if you're generating the data yourself, um, so it's your own data set that um, like is actually what's running your web page or, or your business somehow, like that um, Pagilla data set that we were working with, that people would uh, try to normalize your own data uh, as much as possible. Yeah, so your own data normalize, other people's data leave denormalized is the standard practice these days. Um, we also talked a lot about indexes. Uh, so these are the going to be one of them for your final exam, kind of the main concept that's going to be tested. And um, so you need to, or again, high purpose, big picture idea of indexes, making your select statements uh, much faster. Um, there's this link right here I wanted to, us to take a look at. So this is an incident that just happened a couple of uh, days ago about a company whose uh, product was brought down because they did not properly create indexes on their database. So that company is Auth0. They're a, a single sign-on provider for web pages or um, uh, businesses like the Claremont Colleges that uh, need to have one sign-on for lots of different uh, things. And um, they just, their service went down fairly recently, and the basic idea of what happened was their database became overloaded. And the database became overloaded because they were running SQL queries that were very expensive because they didn't have the proper indexes created. Um, so yeah, we identified three poorly performing queries which impacted performance. They were not like one-off queries, but uh, normal system operation, things running all of the times, uh, not ad hoc, not one-off. And it wasn't until all these queries were complied with a particular set of heavy loads that the poor per performance became problematic. And, um, and so they solved it just by, they did previously did not have an index. And so it was doing what they're calling an unbounded scan is what Postgres calls that sequential scan. And uh, they solve the problem just by create index, whatever. And, and that allowed them to bring their system back up. So this is a, uh, not having the proper indexes is a very common mistake that uh, affects companies and very likely will affect you at some point in, in your future career. One of the temptations of uh, junior developers is then you realize, okay, indexes are so important, let's just create them everywhere. But the downside of indexes is they make uh, the insert statement in particular slightly slower because we have to now maintain both the index and the, uh, and the table information itself. And so we don't wanna just sort of wildly create indexes everywhere. You wanna be, you still need to be careful about the, the indexes that you create. Um, some of the like general types of indexes that we've covered, uh, Btree, Hash, Gin, and Rum are the four that sort of we covered in class. Postgres has a few other uh, index types inside of it as well, and they're good, they're useful, but um, they're just not things that we had time to cover. Out of all seven of these uh, index types, that pretty much covers every possible index that you can have for a database and um, other databases will have different names for these indexes, but, uh, um, but they're really the same thing. And so if you understand these seven indexes, then you really understand everything there is to know about indexing in a, um, indexing a large data set. 
for these four indexes right here, and especially for the, the final, the main takeaways uh, are that if you're using full text search, then you probably want the Jim, Jin, or the Rum index. The Jin is faster for inserts. So if you have an insert heavy workload, use Jin. Rum is faster for uh, selects. So if you have a um, just insert once and then mostly selects after that, um, then the Rum index is what, what you want. Everything else, if you're not doing full text search or a uh, search on one of these complicated types like a JSON, uh, B, or, a, um, or an array, then you want to use the B tree index. And in particular, you, you basically never want to use the hash index. Uh, the, the main disadvantages, again, of this hash index was that um, the only thing that it supports is exact equality. And it has the slight advantage of being in some situations a little bit faster in the sense that it requires fewer page accesses, but even in the best case scenario, it's only like two or three fewer page accesses than a B-tree index. And um, so the B-tree index is uh, just standard, what everybody uses, and everybody would think you're weird if you're using the, the hash index. Um, you'd have to have a very special sort of uh, use case for that. Uh, the general procedure when you're so out in the real world, like thinking, how am I going to structure my indexes? It's always these first two steps that first design whatever the select statements are that you plan on running that, you, that are going to need to be fast and then create the indexes that make them fast. Um, one of the sort of pitfalls that new backend developers or new data analysis get into is start with the indexes. Um, without thinking about the actual select queries that are that you're going to want to run and this is when you do step two before step one that's when you get just too many indexes and and the database bogs down because of that or use too much disk space because of that um, yeah we mentioned there's a lot of other technologies as well so um, other relational database systems um, so these are the this in particular, the asset compliance systems, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, and Oracle. Um, yeah, MySQL in particular, uh, people, there are people who prefer MySQL over Postgres. Uber recently and sort of famously migrated from Postgres away, away from Postgres to MySQL because MySQL is a little bit faster. Um, but again, MySQL, um, their number one priority is not correctness of the data. Um, and Uber was okay that, um, okay, it's okay if we drop a couple of rides occasionally, as long as we can squeeze out a little bit more performance. Um, most systems though, that's not a trade-off that you, that you want to make. Um, then we talked about the NoSQL systems that, uh, they only work with these denormalized representations. So MongoDB, Cassandra, again, the most popular, um, Again, more scalable, but uh, not asset compliant. So even under normal situations, uh, you're going to lose data from, from these databases. If you ever see a presentation by say like uh, Instagram or uh, any of these companies that, uh, big web companies, they'll talk about their, their web stacks and they'll talk about <clears throat> which data they put inside of Postgres and which data they put inside of these other database systems. And, one of the things that they will never explicitly say is that they don't care about the data that goes inside of these other systems. Um, but that's always sort of like implicit in, in, in their decisions. Um, so uh, we talked about Instagram uses that memcache system to make uh, uh, the likes a little bit uh, faster, a lot faster. And the reason they can do that is because like who cares if if the like number is not exactly right. If instead of 1.2 million is what it should be, they return 1.1 million. Nobody's gonna notice that and care. Um, and so it's okay to, to store that information inside of memcache. But if they were storing, um, say like the posts, the actual text of the post inside of these other databases, then um, people would notice if words randomly went missing or uh, posts were dropped. And, and so nobody will store that sort of important information inside these other database systems. That always gets uh, inside of Postgres. 
Um, yeah, this is sort of like the, a very common um, progression as people start learning things, start off learning a, a database like Postgres. Uh, you see other people are using things like Redis or MongoDB or other terms that get thrown around. And so you start trying to learn those. Um, but eventually once you've reached enlightenment, you realize that, that Postgres handles all that stuff and in many cases does it better. And so no need to configure all that other, other junk, just, just use Postgres for everything. Um, let's see, all of these technologies that we've talked about and the ones that we haven't in detail, they're all open source. Um, so these days, technology is not what differentiates companies, their ability to handle big data and get uh, good results out of it. Um, the real differentiation is the data itself and, and how it's deployed. Um, nobody, nobody is, let's see, Google and Facebook are developing their own software, but even they are releasing it as open source, like Google released Kubernetes as, as open source. Um, actually, just a couple of days ago, uh, Instagram announced a new version of Python that they're releasing as open source because their version's a little bit faster, and they're hoping that their new version of Python gets uh, incorporated in the main version of Python. Um, but none of these companies are developing technology and holding on to it as their secret. They're all giving it away, getting other developers experience with it so they can onboard at their companies really easily um, because it's really the data that, that differentiates these companies and not the tech. Um, let's see, there's three things that I just wanted to uh, emphasize about things not to do in your future careers. And um, so the first one is uh, don't use MapReduce when a database is more appropriate. And in my opinion, that's all, almost always the situation. Um, again, MapReduce is like the, uh, the sexy thing that everybody wants to talk about and put on their resumes. Um, but uh, uh, the database is going to be faster and uh, more stable and it's a little bit harder to set up, but easier to maintain. Um, so. Um, always, at least in the long term, be thinking about how am I going to get this eventually, this MapReduce job eventually into a database for uh, uh, better long-term support. The other thing is don't upload your production credentials to GitHub. Um, so we talked a lot about in Docker, that environment file containing your passwords and things like that. Uh, don't, don't let other people see those. Um, when Let's see, yeah, we, we're not working with cloud providers in this class at all. Um, and uh, uh, but that's a very common mistake is that you, uh, you upload, like if you're working with AWS through Docker, then you upload your AWS passwords or, or keys into, uh, into, your, into your GitHub repo, and then somebody else is mining Bitcoin on, on your expense in AWS and you don't realize it until you get your uh, $100,000 bill. Um, so yeah, there's a, if there's one thing to take away from this class, it's this one right here. And then the last thing of uh, never run a, uh, any command that modifies your data set unless you're actually in a transaction. There's a, a, a joke in the database community that um, the way that you advance from being a junior dev or a junior DBA database admin to a senior one is you accidentally delete the production database. Um, and as soon as you do that, you realize that you will never ever run these commands again unless you're inside of a transaction so that you don't accidentally do that. Um, you will probably uh, ignore this advice um, for at this point and continue running commands like this inside of small scale things, thinking that your, your scale is so small that it doesn't matter. Uh, who cares if it gets deleted? And then it's going to bite you in the butt one day that uh, you either misinterpreted how small scale your, your program actually was, or you um, just were overconfident in your command. Um, so the sooner you get into these sorts of practices, the, um, the better it will be for, for you in the long run. Uh, let's see. 
most of the stuff that we talked about in this class has really been focused on like the industry applications of big data and a lot less on the like academic side. Um, so everything related to Docker and all the DevOps stuff, that's all 100% industry. Um, basically nobody in, in, in the academic world understands any of those concepts. Um, I don't, let's see, being at CMC, I don't fully know all of the other professors at um, Pomona and MUD and um, how, uh, how much they know about any of, these, any of those DevOps concepts, but I'd be shocked if more than 10% of, of the professors um, had ever used Docker before, uh, for example. That's just not something that the academic professor sort of people think about a lot, um, but it's like bread and butter industry practice. Uh, what, what the academic people more think about uh, is like the math side of things. So that monoid concept that we we're talking about with map reuse, uh, that would be the, the sort of things that academic people are talking about. Um, and then the hyperlog log, data structure proving that these things are going to uh, be correct in the abstract, who cares about the implementation details. Uh, that's, that's the sort of thing that uh, academic researchers care about. Uh, if that's the sort of thing that uh, you find interesting, that like mathematical aspect of big data, then grad school about big data somehow might be uh, appropriate for you. Um, but if like the, the DevOps, Docker, all of those sorts of things seemed more interesting to you uh, in this class, then grad school is probably not a good choice for you and going on to industry jobs is where you would uh, get a lot of that kind of exposure. Uh, let's see, we also talked about a few open research problems and um, three that I uh, personally care about the most are, so full text search, FTS is full text search, on non-English languages. Uh, basically everybody, whether it's industry or academia, uh, really only cares about English. I'd say that's like 80% of research is done on English, maybe 15% on Chinese and Arabic and a few other um, Spanish popular languages like that. And then that sort of long tail of languages that um, have maybe only 10 million people who speak them. Uh, nobody's ever done any hardly any research at all on those languages. Um, uh, better web scraping for dynamic web pages. Uh, so this is something that really straddles like industry and academia. Neither, neither group of people really feel like it's their domain to, um, uh, to think about this problem right here. And so nobody thinks about it at all. And we have a lot of web pages that people use in practice and build in practice that will never have a, a web archive of. And, and so their information is going to be lost to history forever, um, unless we can get better tools for scraping things from those web pages. And then this uh, uh, efficiently updating materialized views, so those like caches of data, um, those things that Instagram wished they had, and because they didn't have, they had to resort to other services. Uh, this is still a, a major open research problem, um, both on the mathematical perspective of how do we like. Um, so for say uh, queries involving joins inside of them or other complex things, how do we just mathematically represent that so it can actually be done efficiently? And then uh, implementation practic like uh, practicality wise, how do we do that in a way that um, is not going to write, cause too many writes to disk, take up too much space, uh, things like that. So this is a important problem that, uh, unlike this problem here, where nobody thinks it's their domain, this is a problem that both industry and academia are working on uh, pretty actively to, uh, um, to try to solve. Okay, so from your perspective, like where to go from here? I think one of the failure modes that a lot of students get into is thinking, okay, in the, um, the big data world or computer science more broadly, there's just so many different technologies to learn. So I'm going to try to learn as many of them I can, as I can and get as many as I can on my resume. And that's a failure mode. That's not something that you want to do. Uh, you don't want to just learn new technologies just for the sake of doing it. Um, 
or just for the sake of getting it on your resume. There's too many to learn and whatever company you go to in the future, they're gonna have different technologies to uh, in their tech stack that they're working with. And so, and they're not gonna expect that you already have like uh, expertise in all of them. And once you're working at that company, they'll pay you to learn it. So um, it's better to actually get paid to learn it than, uh, than not get paid. Um, uh, let's see. One of the, yeah, so I was mentioning there's sort of too many uh, technologies to so try to learn them all. There's this kind of fun game right here. Is it Big Data or Pokemon? And here it uh, has a link right here, or this is the link, and it just pulls up a name and you have to guess, is it a Big Data technology or is it a Pokemon? Uh, so Azkaban, I think that's Big Data. Next question, Jirachi, I'm pretty sure that's Big Data. Oh, that's a Pokemon, oops. Akiban, let's try Pokemon. Oh, that one's big data. Uh, that one's big data. There we go, so I'm 50%, uh, two out of four. And uh, nobody, most of these technologies, nobody's even heard of, let alone, let alone knows how to use them. Um, so uh, don't feel like because you've never heard of something that you're uh, behind the times with big data, because um, most people haven't. So instead of just like learning things for the sake of learning them, my recommendation is to just go out and build things that, uh, so with the things that we've covered in this class, 99% of web pages, you have the, uh, the background knowledge needed to actually get that done with uh, a web stack that looks something like this, that sort of Instagram stack that we covered in class. Um, it's the same for like a more just strictly data analysis sort of thing rather than, um, actually like a, a web sort of company um, that you have all the tools that you need, need to be able to do that. It's possible that you'll run into situations where there are other tools that would be more appropriate and it's better just to learn them like as you need them. You'll learn them better and, um, and you won't waste your time. It's also much better to be an expert in a small number of texts. So say being an expert in like Postgres and Docker um, than having this broad knowledge base the reason for that is two reasons. One is that a company would, um, well, it's, really, it's just really easy for like anybody to just go through a basic tutorial on a thousand different technologies and add them all to their resume. Um, but it's much harder to actually like build something with a, with a technology. And, um, and so a company likes the fact that you've built something and you've demonstrated that you've built something and can work through whatever weird things are gonna come up and whether you're using Postgres or MongoDB or whatever it is, weird things are gonna come up and you'll have to, to get through them. Um, and that's what the companies are hiring, hiring you for, the ability to get through those weird things. Um, let's see. Yeah, so it's very common for, um, yeah, just get, being like this guy over here getting distracted by all the technologies, just adding all sorts of technologies onto things until you don't even get anything actually built. Um, but if you're, uh, don't be that, actually get something built, you'll have better luck with uh, job searches and you'll just have more fun actually doing stuff, I think. Um, if you do insist on just more things to, to learn, I would recommend keeping with the old technologies that are guaranteed to be around for a long time. Uh, so Bash, SQL, and, and, uh, and Vim. They'll make you more productive uh, on, on all of your other tasks. And so last thing about that is that if there's anything I can do at any point to help you in the future, uh, feel free to reach out, whether it's after you've graduated or before graduating. Um, if there's advice on projects that you want to implement, I'd be happy to uh, to give, my, give you my advice if, if you want to know like how, how can I do this thing in Postgres or is it or should I use a different technology I'd be happy to uh, chat with you about that. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of this class that uh, one of my former students had started um, a company using essentially all of these uh, technologies. Uh, it's a web company that um, uh, it's like a sort of library alternative, uh, Bookshare alternative, and um, and that was his senior 
uh, senior thesis was starting that company. Um, and yeah, what, what, the way that I helped them was designing the backend database, making sure that the tables and things were structured in a way that's, that was actually gonna be useful for him down the road. Um, and uh, so that he could modify the, the project easily when customer requirements change. Um, so I'd be happy to help you out on, on some more things. If you're interested in getting involved with any of those sorts of research topics that I mentioned before, I would be, um, I'd be thrilled to work with you on that. If you have, want to talk about future classes or, or anything else, I'm happy to talk with you about all of those things too. See, so before going on to talking about the finals, is there any, anything else sort of big picture wise from the course that maybe you have questions about or um, want to know more about or anything like that? Okay. So the course final. So again, it'll be uh, we're about 40 points. You're, we currently have about 200 points in the class. So that's going to be about 20% of your overall grade. Uh, not too much, but enough to um, potentially change your letter grade up or down uh, a notch, depending on whether you uh, study hard or not enough for it. The problems, again, will be very similar to the written homeworks, especially the week nine and 10 homework. And it's really gonna be focusing on the indexes and the uh, proper use of indexes, creating the indexes, how many table pages are accessed in different indexes, those sorts of questions. And um, I personally don't think that it's going to be a particularly hard final. I don't think there's gonna be trick questions or anything like that, uh, but based on, uh, the scores on that homework, I think, um, unless unless you put in significantly more effort on the final than you put in on the that homework, uh, I think a lot of you will find it um, pretty hard. So, um, if you do have questions about those the homework, please uh, ask them before the final exam uh, time. Again, on Monday is when I'll post the final exam, and as soon as it's posted, I'm not going to be able to answer any more questions about course material. So if you do have questions about things that you want to get answered, um, please ask them before Monday. Um, so I'll have office hours, there'll be time in class today, and then um, the lab time on Friday to, uh, to ask those questions. I'll, there will also be a chance for uh, some extra credit. Um, so there's five videos, YouTube videos down here um, each, 45 minutes or so long that uh, you can watch if you'd like to. Or I think most of them are pretty cool. So things about like uh, hearing about Instagram's architecture, Reddit's architecture from the, the engineers who, who built those. Or uh, these two are talking about the architecture of different ad tech companies that you probably haven't heard from before. But uh, if you're not on Firefox using uBlock Origin, you've probably seen their ads uh, anyways. Um, and if you watch these videos, all you have to do is watch it, write five things that, that you learned from it, and you'll get uh, and one point extra credit on the final. Um, yeah, when I post the actual final exam, there'll be a spot in there that you can uh, add your, um, your write-up information uh, onto it. Uh, but I figured I'd just give you these links now in case you wanted to uh, start watching them a little bit early if you want this extra credit. And again, it's optional. You don't have to watch any of these videos, just if you find them interesting. Any questions about the uh, final exam or what to expect for that? Could you just reiterate, I'm sure it will probably be stated on there some at some place on the exam, but what resources are we allowed to use or not allowed to use on this exam? Yeah, good question. So on the final exam, you are allowed to use any non-human resource that you would like. Um, so you can uh, use the internet, you can use Postgres, you can log onto the Lambda server, run any commands that you want. You can uh, log onto Stack Overflow, read any questions that have already been answered, um, but you can't be like talking to other people in this class or other people outside of this class about um, the, the details of the question. 
Um, basically, yeah, um, I want it to be essentially um, use any resources that you might find useful on a job or a real world environment other than another human who might be more doing the problem for you than would be appropriate. Um, good question. Any other questions? Um, Mike, when do you have to submit it by? Uh, so you'll have, um, I'll, I'll post it on Monday and you'll have until the end of finals, which I don't, offhand, I don't know exactly when that is, but you'll have at least until, um, at least until the following Monday, possibly the following Tuesday. So at least a week to complete it. And you're welcome to uh, start it and stop it as, as many times as, as you like. And um, um, yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah, so you'll have at least a week to complete it. So I'll give it out on Monday, and you'll have at least until um, the due date will not be before the following Monday. Um, yeah, so finals ends on Friday, but I'm not going to grade it over the weekend. So if you wanted the extra weekend, then you could have that uh, as well. Um, any other questions about the final format? So for these, oh. um, oh, sorry, um, for these extra credit videos, is it do you need to write one thing that you learned from each of them or just like five uh, things in general? It's a uh, five things per video. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And they can be as, uh, as minor of a thing as you want them to be. And it's one point per video. Yes. Okay. Also, is there going to be any uh, uh, query writing and stuff that, like, uh, like, like how it was in the first midterm? Um, there'll be no. Uh, yeah, so the midterm, the the first midterm was all, in some sense, like computerized, um, very similar to those uh, homework assignments that had specific test cases. Um, there will be no. Um, like pre-given Docker containers and uh, Git repository like that, that you can, um, uh, that you, for you to use. You're welcome to create your own Docker containers and, um, uh, and, and run things uh, on your own server that way, but I'm not gonna provide that for you. Uh, the format of it is it's going to be um, half, half of, it'll be just like that week nine plus 10 homework assignment format wise, uh, except that half of it will be the, the written questions and half of it will be the true and false questions. Um, yeah, I have, I don't know, probably 200 different true and false questions that I've uh, given you. You're, you're gonna have significantly fewer than that. Um, that's just sort of like a, a question bank that if you can understand all of those concepts and those true and false questions, then um, then you'll do really well on the on the final. Uh, good questions. Any other questions about the final? Okay, then. Very last thing is just uh, course evals. Um, so you should have gotten an email from the uh, CMC about uh, course evals for the class. Please fill that out. And then I also have a second um, very short class specific eval just asking about um, how much the course material overlapped with other CS classes that you might have taken. This is especially I'm interested for the uh, those of you who are CS majors, um, like what overlap there there is or isn't in other classes that you've taken. And then if there's just other like concepts that you wish would have been talked about a little bit more that are 
uh, big data concepts. Uh, both of these two evals will help me in uh, the, the future when offering this class for future semesters. And so um, uh, uh, please, please take the time to, to do that. Um, that's, let's see, pretty much it though. Um, if, uh, uh, yeah, please, please take the time now to either do those evals or to um, uh, ask any other questions that, that you might have about course material or things that, that might be on the final. Or if, if you'd like to, uh, feel free to take off as our official end of, of class and you can uh, get some sleep or work on your other classes or, or whatever you need to uh, get done before, before finals. <laughs>